this is the, what, I, what I thought, if it's all right with you, a bit of sort of audience participation for yourself, because of course I can tell you how I used it, although the presentation that I, I sort of put up together for you today is not about that. I think there are some real central strands of critical realism, whoever you read, whether it's Bastar or Margaret Archer, that um, you need to really have a grasp of in order to use the theory, and they're common throughout critical realism, and if you've already started using it, you will understand that it is in the tradition, the Marxist tradition, it does reclaim human agency and action, it is action oriented, and that makes it suitable if you are in the realm of social justice issues, particularly. It's very useful for that, and it's what I used it for, but not exclusively, it's a very critical <coughs> approach. So what I thought is that we'd, we'd do this together and think about those concepts and if you can apply them to your area of work or what you're working on or what you're thinking about. You may not be able to. You may use it in part or you may decide, yeah, this is the conceptual framework for me. So I will try and uh, sort out the work. Can you see that? I know it's... Um, can you see that at the back or is that very, very... Yeah? So it is about a theory of action, uh, a critical theory of power, and it explores the interplay between cause and effect, which in the social world is very difficult sometimes to ascertain. For example, if you're a youth worker or a social worker, you might be inputting into a child's or a family's life for many, many years and not see the result or a result that's accepted by an evidence-based framework, shall we say, and that's the lingo today when you're working in local government, public health, social work. They want you to be evidencing behavioural outcomes, visible, tangible outcomes often, but <coughs> you know when you're with somebody day to day that change <coughs> doesn't happen like that, and it happens slowly over time. This is the really strong advantage of critical realism. Everything is looked at critically over time. So it's not a simple, we did this and therefore you can attribute that output to this action. So what I thought to start off with is for us to define critical realism. What do you think it means? I'd like you just for five minutes to talk to your partner. If you're in threes, that's fine. Um, don't leave anybody alone though. Uh, just, just really interrogate those two words. What does it mean to be critical and what is realism? And, and get back to me because I'll be interested to hear. So five minutes on that and we'll see what you come up with. Is that okay? <laughs> we'll start on something simple, you know, defining reality. <coughs> Yeah, but it's 
I think that is specific to critical realism. But being critical means questioning, stepping back, questioning maybe your own value based and assumptions, being reflexive, in order for you to really be critical, questioning about what we take as common sense notions, or even powerful theories that seem, or is it Tina, there is no other alternative, yeah? When, when something is argued so tightly, you can sort of capitulate and say, right, well, okay, then, fair do, that's a really watertight theory, it has a, a lot of strength, therefore it must be worth uh, listening to and I, I can't pick holes in it. Actually, this says, think again, yeah? Question this. Where does it come from, this theory? How did it become so powerful? Where did it begin? In what, in what geographical location? There's always a history, there's always a story to something, isn't there? And I think critical realism, being critical, questions everything, the whole story, not just what you see on the surface. What does human reality consist of? What is that? What does it mean, reality? It's a bit heavy, isn't it? <laughs> it's after me and what's reality. <coughs> you haven't stumbled into a philosophy lecture just yet, but you could turn that way. What is our reality? What's the nature of our reality? We, we talked about history when we were talking about reality, actually. So we were saying how reality, how it's historical, you know, it's something that you can't look at in a vacuum. You've got to look at what's happened in the past. And, and we are historical beings, yeah. aren't we? We yeah. have a beginning date and we have an end by date. Yeah. We are historical beings. We exist through time, do we not? Yeah, yeah. so history. And this is why it's so good for narratives. It lends itself to critical realism. It's a, it is the, the sort of search for stories, if you like, a critical search for stories. So it's a historical concept over time. Yeah? And in with that, what you said, Joe, is about taking notice of histories about the same topic. There could be different historical perspectives on the same topic, but it's actually looking at that whole trajectory. Yeah. Anything else? How do we exist? Are we only in our minds do we exist? Or are we real flesh and blood? Somebody help me. <laughs> so like physic we're like physical beings, I suppose, aren't we? I mean the way You suppose? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I've got belief, yeah. <laughs> I do too, I share that belief. I actually think that we're all real. <laughs> and that we are real in terms of flesh and blood, and that's called embodiment. And we'll go on to that later. That's a key concept in critical realism. We have a physical existence, do we not? So we have a physical existence. We have a historical existence, because we continue. What other kinds of existence do we have? Relational. Relational. Put that down here. Okay, good. Cultural. Cultural. I'm putting these all down here because they're very similar for me. Discursive. Discursive. So I'm going to put it the opposite of embodiment. Okay. You know you exist because you because of what you speak. You have language? It's part of our reality. It's part of our reality. Okay, good. What's <coughs> that? Yeah. We're historical beings. We're physical beings. Come on, social workers, youth workers. Every uh, reality is different depending on the context of where you're from and who you are and how you're brought up. Okay. That's your experience of reality. Yeah. That's subjective. Okay. But we have a common shared experience as human beings. What about a spiritual existence? What about a psychological? We have a mental existence as well, the things that are in our head that not necessarily everybody knows. The psychosocial factors that sometimes regulate our behaviour without us really being totally aware of that. So we have, um, being the old hippie that I am, I'm going to call it spiritual. That doesn't mean religious, that's sort of an inner life, that's psychological way of being, okay? So, being human is quite complex. Even just within this five minute little brainstorm that we've done. But what defines us as human? 
What makes us stand out from any other creature? What can we do that others can't? What do you think? Reflect. Yeah, we can reflect. Now, postmodernists would have said, postmodernists, anybody's a Marxist? Mm -hmm. This is the answer to postmodernism. You know, when, when dark descended over the earth for a long time in the 80s and the 90s, it was there was no other alternative. And this is the response, you know, because Marxism was said to be reductive. It explained everything as, you know, the economic structure affecting human beings and they had no alternative. But this is the response and this reclaimed agency in action. Because although we have language, yes, we do. For Archer, it's our ability to reflect that makes us human. She says there's an inner conversation that we have all the time going on in our heads about who we want to be. Now, that, doesn't, that, that sort of starts when we're born, but we're not in charge of that process when we're born because society, our parents, our carers, influential people sort of input into us, if you like. And I think it's at adolescence when we start to really recreate our own identity in the form that we want to. So, what's going on? She calls it this vexatious fact of society, whereby as beings, as historical, physical and spiritual beings, society creates us. And then we get to a point in our lives where we have the power to actually create ourselves and change others and the world. She puts this down to reflection. Because if you have the ability to reflect, you also have the ability to evaluate. Now she starts to apply this theory to the personal self. So how we acquire identity as well as how we acquire agency. They're very similar cycles as you'll find out later on. So she says, basically, we are who we are because of what we care about. And we only know what we care about when we reach such a point in our adolescence in our life where we reflect and think, what's it all about? What do I stand for? What makes me, Sam Davis, different from you? Or you, or you. Oh, she's a Marxist. She likes growing veg in an allotment. There's things that we care about that, that actually start to become firm in our identity. But they're not there forever because we have the choice to kick them out. And we do this. We're constantly, whether we know it or not, weighing up. Should I continue being that social worker? Has social work changed so much and it's compromised my values and I'm going to choose something else? Should I continue being a senior lecturer at Leeds Beckett? Or has the neoliberal framework of teaching and marking and, you know, registering people through the door, has that changed the experience of teaching so much that it no longer sits with me? We're making these decisions <coughs> all the time. And what happens is, is that over time we change. But not immediately. It's not like some kind of schizophrenic experience, you know, where you suddenly think, oh, I see, you, you were very different last month. You know, what's happened, you know? That can happen, I think, in a traumatic event. But what Archer's talking about, it's a bit like, you know, watching your hands grow old or moss on a stone. You don't notice it's happening, but you're constantly making these decisions about your life and the life of others about you. So you're building identity, and that identity is linked to what she calls interests. And if you're serious about them, they turn into commitments. And they're very different. But it's not a straightforward process because of the vexatious fact of society. And this is this interplay business in critical realism. Did society create me as I am now? Or did I have a hand in it somehow? And if I had a hand in being like I am now, at what point did I become so aware that I had this power to choose? And she uses something called analytical dualism. There's no easy words in critical realism, I don't think. Have you found that? <laughs> but don't be scared by it. <coughs> but these are the key concepts of critical realism for you to get hold of, really. The inner conversation is the first, because that is what defines <coughs> us as human beings and unlike language maybe Wittgenstein would have differed it's not about language it's about action but the ability to reflect is in all of us and that's why it's such a transformational positive theory because it means then that if 
if the nature of being human is reflection and we can all reflect regardless of our intellectual status then it is possible not probable but possible for us to develop agency and become powerful that's the crux that underpins critical realism so it's not sort of oh it's no good we can't do that we've tried it before or it's been done before because different people bring to a situation different things their unique talents and interests in a unique constellation of events which we'll look at in a bit and that's why it's different and it's the powers people talk about power it's the powers that people bring we all have personal power all of us are slightly different we've all got different commitments but we've also got different talents we've got our people power institutions have power structural power and cultures have power and this is the difference with critical realism because it gives power to things as well as living things and when you bring all of these things together in a constellation something happens that's unique but these are the concepts that you've got to have a handle on in order to understand that embodiment we've talked about that it's really important because critical realism says you are powerful but we are human beings we are constrained and we are limited we are constrained by our bodies physically spiritually perhaps and we will die we will decay we're also limited by our environment what is possible and what is possible don't forget the history bit what is possible for a woman in 1830s may be very different to the 1940s to now so critical reason can deal with all of that it takes a political, historical view of powers, our power, and other powers. In postmodernism, power belonged to the word. For postmodernists, the thing that defines people was language. Now, we all know that um, the power of language is a bit strange because you can say that you believe things but you don't necessarily do them. It's rhetoric, isn't it? And one argument in postmodernism is as equal as any other. They don't make any distinctions. There's no moral imperative. Grand narratives are no good anymore. So each other's histories, other's interpretations and experiences are as good as each other. And in that kind of environment, in that kind of theory, you can't really argue yourself out of a paper bag. It is not action-oriented at all. There's no point in collectivising to argue against, I don't know, a, an evil regime or for greater rights. There's no point because it's just our subjective opinion. We could be wrong. Critical realists in the Marxist tradition take a historical political view. They pin their colours to the mast and say, OK, then, we will take a stand, but we are aware of history, not a grand, one singular grand narrative. There are other histories. There are other, other interpretations that are coloured by culture, ethnicity, gender, geographical location. We accept that, but it doesn't mean you throw everything out. Because after all, it's not about words, it's about action, it's about doing something. I remember, this is just, just reminded me, Marxism 1987, was anybody there? I went to Marxism 87, and I, I, I had the, the joy to hear Paul Foot talking about being a socialist and he says we're all on the left he said you, you vote Labour every five years but what does it mean to be a socialist is that being a socialist and he was really focusing on the, the verb to be you can't be a socialist if you do it from your armchair you know you can't be something just because you say you are it and this is the difference I think and this is why it is very good for radical politics, very easily acceptable and assimilated into social justice projects, really. So, you know, this idea that the world is out there but it, it, it might not really exist doesn't wash with critical realism. They say it exists differently for people, but it does exist. So it's, very, it's a very expansive theory. It can cope with a lot. And what Margaret Archer says in a lovely phrase, which I can't find, so I can't quote it, uh, I can't give you the quote, is it can deal with the real messiness of life. And I love that phrase because it can, it doesn't conflate and it doesn't reduce as apparently Marxism did. 
we can argue at the top about that over a beer or two, but apparently it doesn't. But she says, we do. We are constrained by our involuntary placement. It's a catchy phrase, isn't it? It means all the fun stuff. Class, gender, race. We are born into society. And when we're born into society, we are, to some extent, society's being. We are marked by where we are, our class, our religion, our race, our gender, in that particular society. And that will open up doors and it will close others. There's limitation and constraint. But, she says, it does not define us. Why? Because of the vexatious fact of society, of our human existence. Because although we're shaped by it, we can affect it. What do you think of that? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Does it sound plausible? Do you like it so far? Or do you think, hmm, very, very... If there was a disagreement, then we wouldn't have, like, Obama as the president. Yeah? Because say it's dependent on what form of society you live. You have more agency in the United States than, for example, in North Korea. So it's the level of the power relationship in the society you operate in. That's the cultural power. Mm. That's where this, this cultural comes in. You may have, somebody could argue the top about that, but yeah, there's cultural power. <laughs> but this isn't fixed either. This means if you look at the whole world, you know, in terms, in terms of, um, if you like, women's emancipation, in this country you might argue that it's gone forward maybe to the 1970s, then it's gone a few steps back. But comparatively, uh, on a global stage, it's more advanced than other nations. Of course, we're seeing this through our cultural spectacles, aren't we? We're making that judgment. But it's not the same for everyone, this story of our involuntary placement. So the opportunities are different, not only throughout time, but throughout space. And that is really critical to get your head around. Temporalities of space. And it really all that means is that critical realism has always got its eye on this continuing story. Whether it's your continuing story, the people that you are researching, or just life in general, it's always asking questions about that continuum. How, how do you know where you're placed? How do you know where you're placed? Yeah. Well, you... You would, I would think, identify at a certain point in your life. You would be able to say what class you were in the society that you live. This isn't just, this isn't one. I can make a judgment on that. Yeah. But I might be wrong. So for example, don't you tell me if someone in the United States don't really believe that they're free and they're democracy, but lots of other people, like the North Korea, might argue that actually they don't, they're not free. They're constrained to this by, by their wealth. It's the word that you've brought up, it's relate. Do you just say it's relational? It's relational, isn't it, as well? This is another thing that critical realism can deal with. So you might make that judgment, but quite rightly, comparis in comparison to other existences, either in this time or in history, it is relational, and it will always be relational. And I think that's why it's a good critical lens. It automatically leads you to ask questions about the existence of something now, but was it always like that? And is it like that for other people? Are there any holes in it? It allows you, I think, to understand more of your own culture as well when you actually apply this sort of lens, this, this uh, questioning method, really. So does the critical side come to its question to is why is it like that? Then? that absolutely, that absolutely. Why is it like that? And what actually uh, limits people and constrains people? What are those? issues and we're going to look at that now um, I've got a little exercise to do which I'm sure you'll love okay so we'll just go on to the next the causal powers the peps the sets and the SEPs it's really the, the lingo is great isn't it this is a particularly powerful theory in the fact that we normally think of agents as people who have some kind of personal power and maybe they're hooked up in a network and they make it a political power and then through unity and collectivization they become strong. Yeah, that's that's that, that old old grand narrative. 
and the way of doing things. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what this says is that people have to have a certain kind of power and be aware of it through their reflexivity, through their inner conversation. They have to be in the right place at the right time. It's a bit like that film Sliding Doors. You can have great ideas about how to move forward in your workplace or in your life, but if you're not in the right place at the right time, those doors, those boxes, whatever, those opportunities remain locked away. Now you can actively seek them out and change it, which is a really positive thing about it, but you have to find the structures and the culture which will allow your power to come out. Critical realism is about the interplay between these three things. And it's not given. Just because we are human beings who can reflect and evaluate doesn't mean to say that we will become agents or activists. Something has to happen in us in order to trigger such reflection. And that can only happen if we're in contact with the right people, makes sense really, in the right organisation, and usually by structures, Archer means a job role that allows you the autonomy and the freedom perhaps to develop those ideas and connections and the culture. That could be a legal culture, that could be a, a religious culture, it could be the culture of your society that allows you to operate in a certain way to realise your potential. So from Archer, all causal powers are always in potential. The other thing that you need to remember is, again, these are key concepts, is emergence. They only emerge through this magical constellation unique to you and in your time and your place through action. So this idea that everybody can become president of the United States, well actually you find that you'll have to be as a person a very powerful, qualified, well-connected person, I would say to be in the running in the first place. You have to be part of an institution that enables you to develop those powers and ideas and networks and a culture that is prepared to take it on. So Obama couldn't have been president in the 50s and 60s. The culture was not there for him to do that. He, he, his grandfather, his great-grandfather might have been equally as powerful as a person but not everything, not all parts of that ingredient, if you like, were there to trigger the power. But it is not triggered through institution and culture. We have to make it happen through action. We have to bring it into being. And that's why it's so difficult to say A plus B <coughs> equals C. Because over time, we meet people that affect our identity and our thoughts. We go through universities, we, be, we receive awards, accolades perhaps, we become powerful in the eyes of others. We receive opportunities more than others, maybe we recognise them, maybe we don't. And we may willingly then, knowingly, put ourselves in a position where we can use that power. But we have to do it through action. We have to choose to do it through action. In the previous slide, you have pets and other things. What, what does that mean? Yeah, what she does, Archer says that people have power. So this is uh, people's emergent properties and power, she calls them. We've people have certain properties that are different from institutions, and institutions have certain kind of properties that are different from culture. It stands to reason, really, different things in their essence. So for short, she calls them pets, sets, and sets. So what it stands for is cultural emergent powers structural emergent powers and people's emergent powers because you can't say that we definitely have those things they don't come into play unless we will them as human beings into existence and we can see this in history as well I've got a great quote um, somewhere on my phone because if people <laughs> you see postmodern sort of denies the power of agency and certainly individual agency and while I, while I don't want to aggrandize the individual because I think behind the individual is a huge edifice of lots of things that made it possible for that person to be great and do the things that they do or did I've got a great quote from um, Howard Zinn you heard of him so not to believe in the possibilities of change 
is to forget that things have changed. Not enough, of course, but enough to show that what is possible. We have been surprised before in history. Indeed, we can do the surprising. So we just have to think, if we're not powerful, history, again that word, history tells us otherwise. Great leaders. But they weren't on their own. They didn't have these thoughts just... Maybe other people had the thoughts as well. It was time, place, opportunity, a coming together of cultural power, structural power and personal power that did it. So you've got to have certain conditions for agency to happen. So this is really a polar position, what we've had. Modernity's man, if you like, the National Socialist version of the Nietzschean Superman, you know, you are what you are today because of your own efforts. Your own efforts have got you to where you are today. Not your mum, not your dad, not your people that you've cared for or people who've inspired you or whatever's happened in your life. Just you, you know, it's that your own personal power. And along with this, very in line with neoliberal discourse, is that, you know, it, it doesn't, your involuntary placement doesn't matter. Not today. You know, we've got the third way, haven't we? Or we had it. You know, your class, your race, your gender, it doesn't matter because you can overcome all of these things in a democracy and rise above to create your own freedoms, your own kind of life. That is an extreme. The other extreme society is being where you say, well, actually, because of my class and because of my race and because of my gender, I haven't had the opportunity that you have and therefore that's where I am today. You know, I've got no job or... I've got no aspirations or whatever. We can read this stuff in the Daily Mail. If, if you send it out, it's there. Yeah, we are the product of society. We have no real power at all. Too extreme. And what critical realism does is it cuts through this like a knife through butter. And it resists this, this tendency to conflate upwards to modernity's man, giving us all the power over the natural, physical world or it's complete opposite, no power over the physical world, or even ourselves. It's actually, it's a very sophisticated uh, situation that we've got here, which over time, depending on where you are, who you are, what happens, things can be triggered in you, and you can become an agent. All good so far? Kind of, yeah. Right, time for a break, because <laughs> after the break, I did say I was going to get you to do a bit of work. <coughs> so, if all of these things we're saying contribute to us as human beings in our life, and we have the potential to become agents, I want you to think about your own identity over the break and what has contributed to your identity and if you have any commitments that you can share or are willing to share commitments are more than interests that define you, who you are as a unique human being and then we'll come back and we'll look at that because that process is key to understanding agency and critical realism for me is all about agency and power reclaiming that. So if you could just do that, we'll take, um, what's the time now? 45. Yeah, we'll come back at five, get, get a coffee or something, and uh, we'll work together in little groups about our own personal identities, how we acquired them, because the process of acquiring our identity is very, very similar to acquiring agency. I'll show you some pictures. Okay, meet you back at five. <coughs> I'm here for any questions or anything if, if people want to talk or ask questions.
And maybe that was the people you were working with.
identity? Yeah. Okay. Sure, yeah. yeah. Anybody got anything different? The experience. Your experience. Yeah. Want to elaborate? <coughs> well, my own circumstance, you know, when I joined my organisation with two years experience is completely different to having 20 years and that's led me to leave my job and do a PhD. So I might not have left with two years service, but I've left with 20. Yeah. So I think experience can change you. I think it's what you were talking about earlier. <coughs> it can move you in a particular direction, make you reflect and think you're not particularly proud of the organisation that you work within. Um, and that can make you alter your course. Yeah, yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, experience, and it's very closely linked to a key concept in critical realism, embodiment. We experience things as human beings, and that informs our actions, our reflections, who we are. But yes, both your decision-making processes and how you see yourself and where you want to go, the things you care about. So in, in Archer's terms, you no longer care about the police force as you did over time, and all the things that have happened to you in your life, everything, family, career, whatever, you're at a point where you actually re-evaluate and are reappraising your own past to change your future. This is why it's a powerful theory, because it offers alternatives that are future oriented. Anybody else got something? Who are you? What made you? Is there something about opportunity and about being experienced? Because we're all in, because we're all in this room because we've got opportunity to be in this room. So we've made either, you know, an informed <coughs> choice to be in this room. An informed choice. Or just an uninformed choice, potentially. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ponder that one yeah. <laughs> tonight, wasn't well, it? about opportunity. Yeah, okay. I'm going to sort of link that with luck. Something around uh, family upbringing. <coughs> uh, I suppose something about having some core values. Um, and then it's also, it's also about um, inspirational people and and being around people that gives you certain ideas and, and ambition. Yeah, I was wondering whether anybody was going to mention that. Yeah, nature, nurture, we are who we are. Some of it is largely determined, isn't it? Resolving contradictions. Expand. Um, so, like, I suppose as you go through life, you know, you'll see things in a certain way, you'll see yourself within things in a certain way, and as that, pos that position becomes more and more untenable, at some point you reevaluate your beliefs about the world and about who you are in the world, and that those can be like big changes. That's really interesting because that is um, what Sartre describes as if you carry on with something when you're in dissonance, you act in bad faith. Mm -hmm. And Archer does something <coughs> uh, similar as well. Because she says in order to be an agent and develop on that path to real agental power, um, you'd obviously need to be aware of your commitments and act actively sort of work with them. But if the rules change, so if you're thinking you're one kind of police officer and then the force changes and you're doing different things differently that you never signed up for, you experience dissonance, you experience a problem with your values and what you're being asked to do in the workplace. And then if you continue, you'll be acting in bad faith. Um, and uh, what does she call this now? Um, it's on the tip of my tongue. But you start to um, sort of lose interest and your, your ability to engage, basically. I have to uh, get my thinking cap on. Um, is, it not, is it not consciousness? You become suddenly aware of your surroundings and you, you become very conscious of your <coughs> way of being. <coughs> you could be, but, but she's talking about when, when you are an agent already and you're actively pursuing goals and you know your values and you've chosen to work in an area in an organisation to play out those values and you've invested in a role. Investment is really important to Margaret Archer as, as part of the journey of acquiring power. But when things not of your choosing change and change how you do your work, you can no longer pursue your values and your commitments in that role. Yeah, and so, that's happening. sorry, you have to be very conscious that that's happening. I, I think I think usually you are. You, you can, but many people may not have a choice to just stop that job and depart for another. Or maybe they do and they decide that's it. A lot of people decide midlife they're going to do something completely different. 
Isn't it like about a change in mindset though? Because in order to have that change in mindset, there has to be some kind of event that caused you to change your perception of where you are and what you're doing. And that can be an event or doing a master's degree or something significant. That can be a life event. But that's just part of the story, the continuum. Lots of things happen to us. And it's our this, this theory is about analysing and questioning the interplay between what happens to us, our environment, the culture, everything, society, and it's different for different people. But you could have, if you like, your twin sister in the same job with the same experiences, but you would reflect perhaps differently and choose different paths. And it's really good, a good theory, to understand how and why people make the decisions that they do, depending on their commitment. But if you decide to abandon a commitment, that's fine. It doesn't mean suddenly that, you know, you've suddenly changed your identity, you've repaged, you've re-evaluated when the environment changes. And we do that constantly, and mostly consciously, but not as a process like, I'm now I'm going to reflect. We're sort of doing it all the time. Um, and, and saying, well, should, should I continue as a social worker? At what point do I actually stop? I'm not liking this. I haven't enjoyed it for years. But what point do I actually break up? And, and you don't notice how much uh, distance has travelled, perhaps, because you don't sit down and really analyse it. But at some point, you do actually make a decision if you have the opportunity to have a look or whatever. So what else makes you who you are? So you've got luck, you've got environment, circumstance, experience, family values, opportunity. As, a, as an occupational scientist, <coughs> we would define it through the occupations that we participate in. There are occupational roles. Um, so I could be a swimmer, I could be a cook, I could be a brother, I could be a partner. The things that we do. Things that you do. And for that, it would be Archer's involuntary placement again. It's your jobs, it's your status, I suppose, that you would have for that job. Exactly. I've got a little exercise where you can, you can um, follow this path, if you like. You, we all start out you, as a self. You'll see it. There's a, two diagrams that I'm going to hand you out there. Really mapping out the <coughs> journey. Because in the break, you talked about, well, how do you challenge? And there's another guy here. How do you challenge really powerful environments? You know, if, you, if you've got a boss, you can have agency, but that won't do it. Aren't, aren't you leading really too much into agency? Well, actually, in the development of agency, as historical beings, we continue to develop <coughs> in relation to our environment, the chances that we have, the opportunities. And you'll see in the first diagram, if you can. we start off in the, in the, in the bottom left hand corner as people, people involuntarily placed in class, race, gender, the self, if you like, the private self. We move on into the next quadrant on the right, stage two, to become people with interests and commitments, personalities that are unique. We may want to pursue them. So we're just private agents there. That sounds very good, doesn't it? But the thing that actually notches it up a bit is to develop corporate power, corporate agency in this quadrant. And that's when you find a job or a position where the institutional organisation has resources and networks and means that can develop you as an agent, which means that it can give you a platform to play out your values and your commitments as an individual that's connected to others with the same values. But you can't do that on your own. You don't have that kind of backing. But you can use organisations for that. And Arch says it's not just about being an individual that's reflective plus resources. It's much more than that. It's about actively making connect connections, networks, being very aware of how power operates in your organisation, the roles that people are in. And finally, you get to become a social actor. And a social actor, that stage is crucial because then you have the ultimate power to change structures. So in terms of identity, 
you also go through the unreflected self <coughs> when born, the reflective self, and then when you become reflective, you gain commitment, <coughs> and then you can do something with those commitments. This is called the stratified self. It's a process that she's just put down in that kind of crude diagram. The diagram in the book is better than that, by the way, but that just really shows in a very simplistic way the process that we're probably going through in life over time with all these things feeding in and us reacting to them. And then the one below will sh really shows the process of change so we've already been talking about how you used to be a few years ago. Whoops, I think I've used the wrong pen here. Mind. How you used to be in life and the changes that happen. So you've got a diagram with three lines, haven't you? And what she's not saying, you start, you start off here as your reflective, your, your private self. Your private self. And you interact over time and in life with culture, structures, other people. And you develop. And as a result of that interaction, you change over time. And you develop. Not just as an agent, but you develop as a person. And then you come to this position, which is T4, which is your personal interests plus your professional interests, giving you your identity. If you're lucky enough to get both of them to converge, making the personal political. That gives you your unique identity, but it's a process and it isn't cut off, and it's always happening, all of the time. And she calls that the morphogenetic approach. So if we're looking at who we are, it's not as simple as saying, I am the product of my environment, or my family, or my values. Because all of the, some of those things change. Some of them are relatively stable, but over time may change drastically due to an event. Your family values may change, your family might change. And that will have an effect on you. So, this theory is saying all of these things are in the mix and we need to critically evaluate them over time, how they play out on this particular line, on this agent. So she does that through this, and this is called analytical dualism, another key concept of critical realism. And it's just a way to make sense of, of something that's happening in time and space that involves values, thoughts, reflections. That's quite complex to keep all of that up in the air. Emergent powers in structures, culture, people. We're talking about possibilities here. So what's tangible? So the way that Archer makes sense of it is by three simple lines. You start out this way in this environment and when you interact, depending on your level of reflectiveness, oh sorry, Depending on where you are in that quadrant, if you're a social actor already, your interactions will be different from somebody who's not necessarily so reflective, who's just started out as an agent. So she looks at it from all angles. <coughs> there are people who are already corporate agents or social actors so their level of interaction with networks, with people, with organisations and culture will be at a different level from somebody who's just started to have commitments and interests. But the process is the same. You start off here, you interact and you change because of it. You evaluate, you reappraise. I was asked in the break, how did I use this then? Well, I didn't start uh, thinking about critical realism. It found me because I wanted to make sense of my data, and my data was six stories of people who worked in a movement for 40 years. So they've got careers of 40 years. 
And when I asked them, because what I was interested in was the impact of educational policy on their roles. They saw themselves as sort of educational freedom fighters and I thought, okay, then if, if you saw yourself as this and you joined in the 60s to make the world a better place for people from disadvantaged communities, how does Tony Blair's education policy, how has it affected what you do? And they knew exactly how it had affected them at every level of their organisation. They were very reflective beings that were totally able to tell me where they started off when they joined the organisation and where they ended up and how and why. So they were bringing, in, bringing to life to me what Archer called the stratified journey of the agent and they were telling it me through their life story. I joined the WEA to be a tutor because I hated school. And I hated school because it was a brutalising experience where we were beaten for being different from other people, <coughs> you know, the pit village children were, but were being treated differently. So I had a sense of purpose. I wanted to work against that. And he was telling me a really class had affected him all his life, so he joined this educational movement on the back of personal experience. So his personal journey as a person through these quadrants was mirrored in his professional development as a corporate agent and then a social actor. The two were together. And Archer allowed me to explain that story. But then I met another person who told me their story. Similarly, they joined the WEA because they were feminists and they wanted to change the world. And they told me how they started off as a secretary for their husband in the, in the back room before finally getting an education <coughs> and becoming a teacher. They mapped out their journey. Yep, development of agency, I can see it. Reflection. But also in the organisation, they moved from one quadrant to the next whereby they used their commitments to create women's courses, study groups, self-help groups, to change the nature of what the organisation actually offered women. So they were changing the structures. Again, you've got the personal journey and the professional mirroring each other. So I thought, this is great to actually use this as, a, as an investigative tool on my data. But then, something terrible happened because across the six stories, another story emerged where three of them agreed with the direction of travel for this movement that they were in, and three of them did not like where it was going. But all of them agreed with the mission. Some of them said, we don't like where we're going because of this decision made in 1992, which I at the time voted yes for, but now <coughs> I disagree. How do you make sense of six different narratives when people diverge in their actual actions, but their words are in agreement, and then they do something even better and disagree with their past selves. What theory can make sense of that? Critical realism can, because it's a theory over time that says, no, you're not dealing with a schizophrenic here. They haven't changed their politics just because they didn't like the way they voted in 1992 and they've ended up with an organisation like this. The organisations changed, not because they voted in that way, or certainly not just because they voted in that way. It's about politics of the country, it's about educational policy, it's about the people in the movement, it's about the other, there's all these other things that we've talked about already coming into play. But the theory, because it goes over time, can make sense of that. I won't go on the double morphogenesis. I just won't. Uh, but that, that's the bare bones of Archer's critical realism. There are other ways. A uh, guy before he left, he's, he's obviously been um, writing about critical realism for some time. He says, well, in what way have you used the tools of critical realism? I said, actually, it is very good for that, and I have used the tools of critical realism because I went back to the Workers' Educational Association and said, well, look, this is what I've made of your story, your response to instrumental education policy, but actually 
you can apply Archer's tools yourself with your senior management team and you can, you can do your own investigative journey because it shows you how people operate within an organisation to what end, whether they're operating in sync or whether they're pushing and pulling in different directions and you can use these tools to analyse because it's about commitment and it's about development. One of the things that came back was don't you think that you're putting too much emphasis on personal agency? That's one of the big criticisms of this theory. Because our environments of constraint and limitation arguably may be getting worse. We may be having as professionals less autonomy or as private individuals less political power. We may be in more of a surveillance culture. So all of these things shape who we are and what we do. So again, we have to be critical even of critical realism. But those, those are the benefits, that, that the sort of strengths that I saw in it for doing my own work. With your neighbour, I just want, now that you know the basic sort of tools and ideas in critical realism. Think of how you could use it in your work. <coughs> or if, if you don't think you could use it at all, why not? But just have a few minutes sharing how you think you could use it and uh, we'll feed back. And if there's any questions, please ask us to do my best to answer. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to do it. 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 I don't know how to do
remember this, this is a concrete sort of application <coughs> but Mary's journey, if you like Mary who started out not being a feminism, not being a feminist but developed her personal identity around that made it also her professional activity and so if you look at it in terms of personal identity acquisition you can plot where she, by just doing that which quadrant is she in on your quadrant in front of you. If she's already developed commitments of that nature and wants to seek out a job in order to do something with feminism, where is she on that continuum? Two. Yeah, she's not powerful enough yet, but she's got firm commitments 
and so she's seeking out a role and occupation in which she can invest her interests. Now, should that come off, should she get the right job and the support, but what actually happens is she did do, and she ended up developing courses. At that point, she's in quadrant three because she's a corporate agent. They're allowing, the organisation is allowing her as an individual to use her passion, if you like, in a professional setting and to change what they uh, offered. They didn't offer women's courses before this. So as a result, she ends up changing the organisation itself by offering women's courses that were never offered before. But it started off as a personal journey. So there's two things. This is, this is if you like, Mary's trajectory in how she starts off using her personal identity and through her activities with the organisation <coughs> in that particular time and space she develops a social identity, a professional activity and she gets the opportunity to become a social actor. You're only a social actor if you can actually change <coughs> structures, if not you're still in the corporate block. But she actually had enough power and that wasn't just her, it was the fact that there was a lot of working class women in mining communities who took up the courses. And actually, they, they breathed life into an organisation that was dying. Thousands of women joined the WEA in the 90s. So it wasn't just her power, but it's her use of power and how it enabled her to become a social actor, but the organisation to change. So that's, if you like, that, that's the morphogenetic sequence in action, where the structure starts as one thing, somebody's interactions change it, and it becomes another. But the difficulty is, is that you've got to remember the other journey, which is her social identity journey. She starts off as non-reflective, becomes reflective with commitment, then starts getting really savvy and thinks, actually, these are social commitments, these are political commitments, I'm going to... The, the, the awareness of the corporate agent is immense. They know exactly how to use the resources that are available to them through an organisation, and then finally getting the chance to become a social actor, which again isn't just their decision. We, you know, we may all want to be CEOs, but actually it's not our decision. There's a lot of things that go into that. So there's that. And like I say, I won't mention double morphogenesis because that's the next step on from that. But it is quite complicated. But if you think about it in terms of your own life and how you've become the people that you are, there's a lot that's gone on and there's a lot that could have been different that is up to you that, has, that, that could have been in your court, but some of it hasn't been. So it is difficult, I think, to get all of that. And it helps if you've got an example to take you through the processes and the narratives. If you're interested, I did do um, narrative inquiry. I heard somebody mention, this is how I actually analyse narrative inquiry. And you know, my thesis is available to actually show you how I use the tool. But I'm interested in knowing how you are thinking, potentially, of using this in your own areas of work. Has anybody got anything to share and discuss? Can I just say that we didn't get that far because we have too many <coughs> issues, if you like, with yes. it. Yes. three. So, like, for instance, we said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing what we said now, so please do jump in if I'm not paraphrasing it correctly. We said stuff like, what if, for instance, you know, in, in Paul's um, profession of being a community nurse, you know, kind of, you know, you're visiting people whose lives are so limited and so shit to use a yeah. <laughs> that they don't, you know, that, that they resist reflection and, and, and kind of gaining agency because they don't want to go there because it's like opening a Pandora's box kind of thing. That if, you know, that I can see how this really applies to people who maybe become professional and maybe there is there is movement in their life through some of the things you just talked about there. But what about people who, who I'm not really explaining this very well. No, you are explaining it very well. Actually. Actually. You said those. What, what, what about a person with learning disabilities? Yeah. Okay. Um, is it therefore the case that with through critical realism that they're not a person? Does it just fit this framework? I'm talking about someone who has profound, who's profoundly learning disabled, so therefore doesn't kind but, of, you know. But you. I mean, I wouldn't want to make assumptions. Uh, I mean, I believe that everybody can learn, even people with learning disabilities, and even people with illnesses that debilitate them. They learn differently. And I think, uh, personally, I think I fall short in meeting them halfway to making an effort into the, the new ways in which they communicate and learn. I, I believe that personally. 
But I've got to say that the, one of the um, narratives was of a miner's wife, so she wasn't a powerful person, mm. and she wasn't uh, what we would call an intellectual person. Mm. And during the miners' strike, her husband and her son were on the picket lines, and she was in the soup kitchen. And um, an outreach worker from Northern College came to uh, read novels, really. D.H. Lawrence is what they read. And how they read those novels, it was about using literature to make sense of your own life. So they thought that's what they were doing every week with Edna from Northern College, was just reading a nice story and having a chat about how they had similar experiences. Except they enjoyed it. They built a network of friends. They became politicised by, by just the times, the 80s. You either were or you weren't. You know, there were yeah. so many things. <coughs> Edna's role, what did Edna do? What was she talking about How, when she analysed Z.H. Lawrence's book? So, so much stuff was going on. And um, at the time, then, there were, you know, the position of women, I think, wasn't entirely great. Certainly not of unqualified mothers of four. And she went out and she went for a job that was advertised as a tutor, as a community tutor. And she turned up and she said, I, I, want, I want to do a rooms course. And I said, oh, you want to do one of our courses? Ironically, the ones that Mary had created from the 60s that had just kicked in. She went, no, to teach. I want to teach. I said, I've got real experience as a woman in a pit community. I've got a lot to offer. I can go out and that's what she did. So it's not just for red the ready-made professional. It's a really empowering thing. But your, your example again is that person on the rise that uh, you, you said, I think this is an answer to that, the sort of, um, one of the examples you gave was the sort of modernity man, somebody that's, and all your examples and all our examples in the classroom of being the person that's doing well and moving positively up through the quadrants. What about the person that's um, in quadrant four that has a, a, a serious illness? Finds themselves housebound uh, and a loss of social network. But uh, is it is that situation because of their personal actions, or is it because of how do we provide or treat or engage with people with terminal illnesses or disabled people? Do we give them a role in society? Do we enable them to become educated in a way that's meaningful? Do we value people? How do we value them? Critical realism in the first instance is that questioning. Why are they in that particular situation that is so powerless? And it moves away from the individualism because you've got your, your causal powers, you've got your society. Society, we are again, it's this we are society's beings, aren't we? And some of us remain there because of society's limitations and constraints. That's the key question on critical realism. It, it strikes me, it's, it's like the two theories of history. You know, one is people are heroic they make history, the other one is they are driven by forces which they respond to, but your argument about the woman discovering feminism. If feminism didn't exist as a concept, if she wasn't, if feminist literature didn't exist, if there wasn't some form of media transmission to her feminism, she wouldn't have, would she have invented feminism you know, as if by magic? Yeah. So it's how much she actually re, you know, responds to, where do you <coughs> put the weight? Do you put the weight on the individual changing the world? Or do you put the weight on the changing of the world, changing the individual? And this it, 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 sorry, can I just yes. that? Yes. Except that it's, it's really only through women's agency that we even, that feminism even came about and we even know about it because they were all talking about their experiences and saying, look, the way the world is depicted to me, so I'm talking about women in the sort of second wave, yeah, yeah. is not the world that I know, you know, so, you know, the world of work, it means you go out of the house and you get paid. Well, that's not my world because my world of work is, you know, washing clothes and making food and so you know and in, in the kind of framework that I'm using in my editing which is in, in, in institutional ethnography which I struggle to say it is about one of the phrases that, that, that jo Jonathan Smith uses is it's about the human human doings of human beings which kind of tries to overcome this structure or agency mm -hmm. like it's through action it's through the actions of women past mm -hmm. but actually it has um, it's not just a resonance it creates the the world that we're living in, you know, dead people, dead people's agency has created the world that we're in. We don't recreate it Groundhog Day. It encourages you to look where, why, how, and of course it'll be different for every patient that you have or a person with a learning difficulty that you come across. Their situation is unique. 
if they're different, their possibilities are different. But how do the structures and the culture enact to enable? Do they enable or do they hinder? I think it's a great tool. And this is how I ended up actually using it. I'm showing you critical realism, if you like, a strand of critical realism. Its application is up to you. And, and in applying it, it brings, it brings the difference between people's rhetoric and actions to the fore. But also, I think it enables you to look deeply at, at, at a situation and, and see what's possible and what isn't and why that may be so. That's why it's so useful. I think, I don't, I don't, um, you, you can, I mean, I agree with you, Paul, it, it is like this polarisation. You can look at things and you can say, oh, but you are as you are today uh, because you're disabled. Uh, and you can read into that what you will accept. If you're doing it as a piece of study, you're going to have to define what you mean by disabled. But do the structures disable that person as well? Have they disabled us in the fact that we um, limit our opportunities and our offer to people with learning difficulties? I'm not shying away from real difficult situations. There's still possibility in all of us to our, our dying days, but possibilities are different. They are different if, if we are uh, physically. I suppose it might be our interpretation of, of the diagram. It just looks to me as the diagram that it's a bit like the hierarchy of needs and expectation you work through them. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's that might just be that. Again, what you're saying, which is, you know, yeah, this is my fault, yeah. really. Focus on that circle that says keywords in potential and emergent. Yeah. That lovely little route that seems to, you know, again, the big thing is, is not <coughs> everybody will do this. It's in potential and it's dependent upon a number of things happening for a person to move from one to the next to the next. And, um, and when I applied this to the zoo, don't forget the people that I interviewed, it was 40 years of their life that it had taken them to become social actors. I purposely chose people who were powerful, yeah. right? But their journey didn't start off that way, and it took them 40 years to do so. But it's not showing, it's not used just to show the, the, the journey of agency. The, the tools of critical realism are a questioning critical mind that says what forces are in play to enable or hinder and it gets you away from that individualist mode of thinking we are what we are because of our own efforts i'm kind of interested in kind of the collective aspect of this as well so we talk about individuals and people feeling empowered and then suddenly developing doing different things one, one thing i'm doing is i'm uh, i'm having focus groups with um, voluntary groups so groups that are operating within communities. And I'm we're talking about how they were established, uh, what the issues are, and and how public agencies come back to support them to be groups and to develop and everything else. So I suppose for me, this, this is quite an interesting concept and kind of framework to maybe try and understand that. But I suppose people might, it might be, Obviously, this is made up of individual people. So, is there something around the collective? The nature? corporate agency is the collective. The corporate agent is the collective agent. Right. So that in Mar like I say, Margaret Archer says it's it's not to be thought of as the individual plus what an organisation can offer them. You know, the fact that you've got a photocopier and telephones and whatever and posted it, that that's, that's by the by. It's somebody who sees the opportunity <coughs> that an institution whether that be travel, meeting other powerful, powerful people, networking to further their agenda, which is made up of their commitments, which are not just their personal agenda, it's a personal agenda that's become a professional, it's part of their social identity, it's part of who they are. So for example, you could come from the community, you could have been a volunteer, and you decide that through that experience, you need to change the structure of the council in order to enable more people to have that experience because of what you learned. But you've got to be a social actor to change the council because the council has an agenda and that's formed by people who do have power. So first of all, you have to get corporate power. You have to be somebody of worth in their eyes to enable to inform policy. So you, you actively reflect on how you're going to get there with others. And you're not just a powerful individual, you actually have to have champions in order. Because the organisation has to, to, if you like, support your further rise to become an actor, somebody who they will follow and who will change the organisation to make it fit for purpose in the future. That's part of it as well.
well. So the problem is, is if your vision differs from the corporate agents that are already, yeah. and that what that means, if you look at it through a critical realist lens, is time and a place is not right for you. They're not ready for you. Mm. And if you continue with people that are not in sync with you, you'll experience that dissonance and you will feel, you will start drifting. That's what she uses. It's such a simple word. You drift because you have no purpose in the organisation. But should the time and the place be right and they can see that, my God, Anthony, you're the best thing since sliced bread and we really need to get your ideas put in the policy, you will find you're having more agency. But it's collective agency at that level. And then at a social actor level, it goes really back to a lot of individual power, but with others to, if you like, change the organisation in the way that you see. But it's all come from a, a, a source that's been in the making for a long time throughout your personal and professional history. Don't know whether that, does that explain it? Any, any more questions, any more things that people want to share?